Hi, this is Paul. I want to spend a little bit more time on the But Why Christianity, John Verveke, Jordan Hall, Jonathan Peugeot conversation. A lot of this conversation tries to deal with how well we can map. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, there's always the, let's say, it's the Christianity that I know versus, let's say, Christianity as such. It's the... Um, the Christianity that I find distinct from other religions, but of course my knowledge of Christianity and my other knowledge of other religions are limited. I know a lot more about Christianity than I know about other religions. You also have the inside-outside dynamic that if you identify as a Christian or if you were raised as a Christian, you have an inside knowledge of Christianity that an outsider can't have, especially when we talk about all four P's of knowing. There's the perspectival, there's the participatory, not just the propositional. Generally speaking, when we look at other religions, we often look at them propositionally. And in fact, especially in the modern period, religions were sort of compared propositionally. And, and you, always have, you always have that difficulty and that challenge when you try to compare other religions. There, there's a lot of talk about particularity and duality or non-duality here. And th there's a lot of talk about trying to get a sense of the ultimate. Now, one of the things that was sort of ringing in my ear when I was watching the new conversation was this conversation from December 2, 2019 between Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke. And it's a fascinating conversation. I remember watching this conversation. I'm sure I made a video about this conversation. The three of us were already in conversation at this point. There was a lot of conversation between emanation and emergence, um, top down, bottom up. Jonathan Peugeot mentions the creation of Adam where you have the gathering of the dust of the earth and the breath of God as sort of top down and bottom up. But the point that I remembered in this conversation when back then also in 2018, 2019, we're talking a lot more about narrative was I, I, had, I had used an analogy of machine code for narrative and John Verveke challenged that and said, yeah, but narrative has to be learned. We learn narrative. We teach each other narrative. In other words, narrative isn't, see, Janine, machine code is sort of a, I, I'm not a computer science major, but I remember in college, I had plenty of friends who were studying it. So you'd learn the language, which is sort of up here, and then you, ha you needed something to sort of connect the machine to the computer language, and so there was sort of machine code in between. And I don't know if I was using the analogy right or what, but so we talked a lot about narrative back then. And, and I remember at this point, Jonathan made the point, which I thought was incredibly important, where... I thought it was incredibly important where... And this gets into the, the, the two, uh, let's say, the two places to stand. We'll call it that. So the one place to stand is the personal. It's my point of view. It's where I see the world. It's my knowledge of Christianity versus my knowledge of the other religions. Now, I was listening to the, the Peterson, Brett, and Heather conversation. It was wild on so many scores. But Heather at one point, Heather Heing at one point gets to the point of basically taking the scientific approach, whereas we want to look for, let's say, up, we want to look at public knowledge. Sometimes we call that objective knowledge. And I, I prefer public knowledge because the idea is that any one person from within a public should probably be able to come to quick and easy agreement on a set of things that are sort of up here. So where my personal point of view or my personal perspective has a, a view on the world, there's sort of the world as such, which uh, is sort of the default monarchical vision, as I'd, I'd often call it, 
And then there's sort of the public, which is kind of in the middle, because it's quite clear that whereas people who share your culture share a certain certain group of bodies that you participate in would easily be able to come to agreement in that public space. What we know about pluralism especially is that there are m many ways in which even the objective, and so then of course the, the goal of science is to keep trying to get kind of beyond that. But the irony of that pursuit is that the, the more we try to expand the public it's not that we're just sort of in our mind's eye obtaining knowledge that comes from a view from nowhere, but we're actually usually expanding the public view that has that knowledge. In, in other words, the, the, the sin of scientism is that it forgets itself. It, that is that in conversation after conversation after conversation, Jonathan Peugeot makes the point to usually sort of people in the realm of scientism that says, oh, we have all of this objective knowledge up here, and says, well, but where are you standing? And of course, that metaphor makes no sense because the idea is, no, we have this monarchical vision. All of these things are universal. And again, to go back through how many years of videos we believe that they are universal because, let's say, they are observations and knowledge built on the arrangement first of physical things or on maybe even psychological dynamics that, at least from our public perspective, have been challenged in multiple cultures. Although, of course, there are many dead cultures that you could not ascertain to check that with, and you also can't check it with future cultures. And, and this is... This is part of the reason why a naive perspective of the, from the Enlightenment is passing away. Not only has religion been shaken by pluralism, but scientism has been shaken by pluralism. So we have this mental map of sort of what's above and below, and a lot of what's happening in the the Verveke Hall conversation is, as John and Jordan tend to do, they go very, very high. And, and they're always looking at sort of the extremes of our knowledge or the extremes of what we are trying to reach as universal as possible. And I played the end of it where Jonathan Peugeot says, you know, we're, we're very meta, let's bring it down to earth. Now, part of the point that Jonathan made with respect to narrative in this video was really important. The, it's like, if you say something like that you can reach a state which transcends narrative, I would say, yes. And then I would say, but that, that when it comes back down, it's narrative again. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and uh. so, so, so it's not, so the denial of something in, in a hierarchy, the denial of the particulars, actually is the 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 is the, the the invisible essence of their coming together in the on the lower on the lower mm -hmm. aspects uh, and so to me and so if like for example so that's why you know that's why i i really struggle with the arguments sometimes where someone would would tries to kind of like step up above religion and then look at the different religions and say there are examples of different of different mm -hmm. things and it's like yeah but if you come down, you have to be on a path and, and that path is coherent. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Like in, in terms of, 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 of the, let's say that if you can reach a state, let's say a, 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 yeah. a, a mystical state where you're above, where you, you, you encounter something which is above narrative and is above even identity and is like, you know, this, this kind of uh, infinite moment, um, that doesn't it doesn't destroy reality it actually oh, no, then feeds would, it would, it makes reality yeah, yeah. real 
Oh, I, I, and, and that's exactly how people respond to experiences of ontonormativity of the really real. They come back and they transform their cells and they transform their lives to try and bring it closer into conformity. There's, there's an there's a inspiration in that sense, it, right? It, it, it informs and transforms their cells, their relationships, and their world. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I wasn't denying that. I mean, I think... Uh, I. I uh, I, I agree that if we you know, I'll use the your language when you're coming back down, um, that and that's where I think you you get the the gap between sort of metaphysical necessity and psychological indispensability. You fall into a particular narrative. I do think the different narratives do emphasize different things. I think, I mean, I think Christianity speaks about and, and, and does the best the best sort of on agape. I, I, I've made that argument. But, you know, I think there are other experiences that are deeply contributory to meaning in life. And I have good empirical evidence for this. I think flow is really deeply important. And Christianity doesn't say much about flow that much. When I mean, Taoism is the religion of flow. It, it's got a lot to say about it. It's got a lot of practices. And you're going to, if you want to, if you want to become a much better flower, Taoism is the place to go. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, and now, now, part of what's really nice about I just have this memory for old conversations. And so if you were to ask me, what did they say here? I probably couldn't come up. But when I'm listening to the new conversations like, wait, wait a minute, I remember John and Jonathan having this conversation. And and I didn't remember it exactly right, because the way this intersects, I'm going to take a quick screenshot here so I can have something for the thumbnail. So then when I'm watching the new conversation, and especially when they get talking about they get talking about theosis and a deeper capacity to suffer. And I thought this conversation really got going when when John Verveke asked about a personal relationship, because now suddenly we they're gonna have to deal with the question of okay, the way up here. The capacity for the way up here to love this way. And and then the the truth of God's love. And for me, of course, that very much gets into this long time, these two containers on my mental workbench of God number one and God number two. Because it's like the God number one is way up here and the God number two comes down in love. And Jordan... You know, Jordan basically presses into C.S. Lewis's observation about there are many myths about dying and resurrecting God, but here we have, in a particular place and time, someone who seems to act out that dying and resurrecting God and does so in a culture that prohibited stories of dying and resurrecting gods. That's why when we have the lead-up conversation for the Northwestuary, and um, Michael Martin and others were talking about, well, make Christian paganism again. And to what degree is, you know, Christian, some Jews look at Christianity as sort of, you know, paganism. And you can sort of understand that because, of course, Christianity brings in the dying and resurrecting God, this thing that had sort of been outside of the fence and brings it right then into the middle and tries to fuse it then with, the Jewish story. Now, of course, resurrection was was deeply within Yosef. Um, should have paused. Yosef pointed me to, um, me to that really excellent book on the the Jews and the resurrection, and that that was just fascinating. That was just fascinating. And and so again, understanding Jordan Hall here, coming at this from the game B, the the the, the breakup of the game B moment and community. Whereas Brett Weinstein is organizing a rally in Washington, D.C. and using Woodstock. I talked, I had a conversation with Byrne Power today, and I, I had to talk to Byrne about that because it's like, you want to have this rally to sort of set things straight. 
and you use Woodstock? Is Altamont coming next? I mean, Woodstock, in a sense, was sort of the, the you get to the top of the hill and then everything starts to crash. Woodstock was sort of, we're, we're seeing the vision, we're seeing the vision, we're seeing the vision, we're going over the cliff. That's that's the ad, that's the analogy you want to use, really? And and especially Brett Weinstein, Eric Weinstein's brother, Eric Weinstein, who perpetually harped at the fact that the boomers were keeping their money and we have these boomer presidential candidates and boomer, 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 boomer. When will the boomers let go? And now suddenly the new defining moment to launch, launch to save the republic and launch into, into our fresh new future is sort of the quintessential boomer myth of Woodstock. These are all little videos that I thought about making today, but never made it. And when they don't make the little videos, they get into the big videos, or maybe they get in anyway. I don't know. But the point of, of Jordan Hall is he he's, he's having this game be experience, this game be community, and they go into spore mode, as Jim Rutt says. And Jordan Hall decides on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, Jonathan Peugeot completely understandably when John Verveke says that Jonathan Peugeot sort of backs up and says, now, wait a minute. I, I, I <laughs> personal relationship with Jesus Christ from within the family of Christian communities that got a little shallow and a little weird, but yet I think there's something foundationally correct about it. And it's right there in my definition of, of a Christian, which is a Christian is someone who trusts Jesus more than they trust themselves. Because a personal relationship with Jesus seems to be sort of the foundation of this. I'm not going to get anywhere in this video. I know this already because it's already 525 and I'm really got to be home by six. And I just had another rabbit trail go in my mind and I can't resist it. So I've been reading, it's a short book. I've, I've been buying books in CRC Church History. I've been reading In God's Crucible, an autobiography by Idzerd Vendelin. Now a whole bunch of people are going to say, Vendelin, that's a dorm on Calvin's campus. It is. He wrote this book in 1950. This book was copyrighted in 1950. And, and Phlebas sort of set me on to this book. It's, it's a... Recently, there appeared a pamphlet entitled Youth Speaks on Calvinism. It caused quite a stir in our circles. We all wanted to hear the voice of, of youth, especially since the young men who expressed themselves in this booklet were students at Calvin College, writers, um, people of education. This was, this was in the 1940s. This was not the 1960s. This just fascinated me because in the 1960s, there were... Oh, can't reach the books. <laughs> there, there were all of this. I mean, this from the 40s to the 60s was all of this deep change that was happening. And of course, in the 60s, it accelerates and goes to the top on Woodstock and then goes over the cliff and crashes. But these young people wrote this pamphlet. I haven't been able to, able to get a hold of this pamphlet. Oh, here, here it is. One of the members of Youth and Calvinism Group, which published The Youth Speaks on Calvinism, a challenge to the church, Baker House 1948, asked me for my opinion on their public publication. My answer was that they moved in too narrow a circle. It was well to speak on Calvinism and today, but we should not forget that today's roots are in yesterday. And at this point, Idzard Vendelin was an old man. And so he starts his story about being um, born. This consideration led me to write about myself and the way the Lord has led me. I hesitate to do so because, of course, he doesn't have that high level of narcissism that we all have right now. Thank you, Internet. I feel that this is quite a pretense to write about myself. It is likely to give the impression that I consider myself as being a man of importance. But my life has been interwoven with the history of our Reformed group which emigrated from the Netherlands and particularly with the Christian Reformed Church in the old country and in the new world. Besides, I see so plainly in my life and in of a former generation that God is the God of the covenant who keeps his promises from generation to generation. And I am convinced that it is necessary to inform our young people about the way God has led their fathers. 
The great scriptural truth should be emphasized that God is the God of the covenant who shows loving kindness unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments and who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generation of them that hate him. So little notice is taken of this great truth. And he goes into it. And now pretty soon, okay. My paternal grandmother kept a diary which is still in my possession. In this she wrote about the baptism of my father, who was born May 17, 1842. That's about the time that my great-great-grandfather was born. So Idzard Vendelin is about the age of my great-grandfather, who was the one who was the who was the Jew who emigrated to the United States and moved in with all the Reformed Dutchmen. And of this, um, and of that, of his two older brothers, they were baptized in the, now I'm going to, the, the Reformier, the state church, at Colum Friesland. She writes that her husband and she herself thought that they should have had the children baptized by a minister of the secession. Now the secession was going on in the Netherlands there was in the in the countryside churches that seceded from the state church they wouldn't let the state church send them ministers they persisted in the singing of hymns uh, i'm sorry of psalms only there are a number of points in which they disagreed with the state church so they seceded and they were sort of this conservative rural church now if you understand what's been happening in the christian form church now you have to understand that the 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 conservative rural roots grow deep in the Christian Reformed Church even before they came to America. But that's not the point that I'm going to make here. Her parents especially were very much opposed to the seceders. And since they were more or less dependent on them and did not want to offend them, in other words, the, the, um, the seceders might have had the upper hand there, and so they, they, they had to be careful with the seceders. I should make this bigger. It's not surprising that young people did not dare to obey God rather than man. Such an interesting phrase because he's basically saying that, you know, if they had had courage, they would have been more countercultural, which would have been be with the seceders. Um, the youngest child of by my father was born eight years after the secession, the offskiting from the reformed, the, 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 the reformed church. The seceders at that time were very much despised and persecuted. It took courage to join them. Besides, my grandparents were living in a section of the country where many had a wrong conception of the covenant of grace and subsequently of the meaning of holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism was another point that this, the offskiting was differing with the state church. But still not to the point, that, uh, the point I want to make. My grandfather, Vendelin, for one, had not made confession of faith and never took his step, although he became 87 years of age and undoubtedly was a God-fearing man. What does that mean? At a time, and in many Dutch Calvinist churches, there was the fear of making confession of faith. Confession of faith is sort of like confirmation for you Catholics. It's usually happens in your teenage years where you basically say i affirm the covenant that was um the the covenant that brought my baptism and i want to make this faith my own well why wouldn't an 87 year old man who hadn't made um never made confession of faith and there were many such people who hadn't made confession of faith in fact in In this book, part of what Henry Kuyper in the middle of the 20th, early early part of the 20th century, early middle 20s, 30s, 40s, was trying to do was to get people to make profession of faith. Well, why wouldn't that 87-year-old man who was so devoted, I can still see him sitting in his big wicker chair reading books like Petrus Imens, um, The God-Fearing Communicant, to find out whether he had the marks of a truly converted man. He did not detect those marks very clearly. Hence, he did not dare to make a confession of faith he feared he did not have. He felt that he must be fully assured that he had certain experiences before approaching the table of the Lord. He was afraid that he might eat and drink damnation upon himself. What does that mean? For many in the church, they dare not make a public profession of faith unless they had had something akin, let's say, to a mist personal mystical experience that vouchsafed 
that proved that they themselves were the genuine article. Now, obviously, much later on in Pentecostal churches, that might be speaking in tongues. Um, but in order to, now if you look at these church, in order to be able to testify that they are a Christian, they should be able to testify to this experience. And so here, he writes about his grandfather, who at 87 years old, he looked up to him as a, a man of faith, he was obedient, he was diligent, he was all of these things, but he couldn't testify to that mystical experience. So what you see then in subsequent generations is that the Christian Reformed Church sort of pivots away from that and says, you know, the, 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 the mystical experience or the not mystical experience, it doesn't matter. You're saved by grace. And, and so you should make profession of faith and you should be a faithful Christian. You should do all of that. And, you know, in all of this time that we have now where people are just so fascinated by mystical experiences and wanting a mystical experience, it's, it's helpful to read in past generations that they dealt with a lot of these things. Now, now where, was I, where was I going with this? Oh, okay. Um, so they're talking about particularly beyond duality, but this is the part, about minute 41, I really started getting into this video. Yeah, so uh, again, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to be playing with uh, like wooden knives right now, but you, you're going to get that. I think this might get there. So an invitation to, to break the wheel of karma, a, a, a vow not to leave the wheel of karma until every other conscious being, sentient being, has done so. Sentient. Sentient being. Compared to an invitation to get on your cross. The, the, the proper orientation of the transcendent with the imminent is to pour itself into it, and to actually so utterly love creation. And this, yeah, this is, this is it. So it's the, the key is like, man, Christians get this wrong all the time. Um, By the way, can I just interject in very, uh, one phrase? I respect the fact that you are demonstrating genuine reasonableness of entering into self-criticism. <laughs> so I just wanted to I just wanted to appreciate that. So please go please go ahead. <laughs> yes, I, I think actually in some sense you may be speaking for the comments as well. Everybody, John just said we're, gen, we're this is genuine reasonableness, not yeah. just incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. So it's it's the it's almost like the reverse direction. This notion of escape versus immerse, right? The 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 the, the, the call is not to alleviate suffering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the call is actually to recognize that the world is so rich that suffering is intrinsic and meaningful something like that right? that mm -hmm. god the actual transcendent you know uh, you know buddha nature but in this case comes into re reality and lives directly with other people and suffers in fact not just suffers but allows himself to take on the fullness of suffering. Not to have us escape it, but to remind us that that's actually the thing. Okay. Right? We, we are not, we are not um, it's not like, oh man, suffering was an error. Tell you what guys, I'll give you a suffering band-aid so nobody ever suffers anymore. That's not the thing. It's rather, no, the way this thing is supposed to work is, is, is you're descending into a deeper and deeper capacity to suffer because that's what engagement with reality actually is is to undergo right to undergo reality experience and to grow and to mature and so instead of dying and escaping what happens is you die and you enter into even deeper capacity to enter into relationship with a large and ever expanding reality um and this again this is the the opposite of a, of a naive notion of non-duality which is a an elimination of difference, right? Right. It's actually, yeah. no, no. It's a, an embracing of difference in a deeper wholeness that produces a deeper capacity for differentiation in an ongoing unfolding. Okay, this was really good. Um, and I, uh, none of these compliments I'm giving you are facetious. Uh, so I'm trying to put a couple of things together. You, you got the, you, this is like an extended version of the reciprocal opening, that, what you just did. Mm -hmm. So you're acknowledging that that's good. Yep. And I take it that that's what you mean by joy. The problem with when people hear joy is they just mean, they think intense pleasure. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we're talking about here. 
Um, and, and of course, you can forgive them for that because we have this stupid word enjoyment, which just means intense pleasure, uh, which really messes people up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got that, and we've got the idea that this reciprocal opening can be very, Jonathan was pointing to, like there's a universal temptation to misunderstand, misconstrue the reciprocal opening as escape. Rather, it's an entering into deeper and deeper relation, is, right? And that's properly agape. Right, because it's anagogic, ag agopic together. Am I? Is that landing? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. fa fairly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then the idea here um, is that what Christianity offers is an alternative in which ontonormativity, normativity, being as fundamentally good, not ethically good or aesthetically good or even epistemically good, right? Beyond the true and the good and the beautiful, it's just being is good. In this in this ontological sense, and and it, 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 that's what I heard you saying in some sense. Is that is that fair? Like I, I, you're getting a sort of a reading of Genesis. God looks at mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the world is good. Um, right? and he, and he does. He's not making a moral judgment. He's not making an aesthetic judgment. He's not making an epistemic judgment because he's God, right? <laughs> so he's he's saying something else. He's saying that being is intrinsically good qua being. Just by being, it is good. Mm. It, am I getting, so that's why escape is fundamentally wrong. Mm. Because if being is intrinsically mm. good, seeking mm -hmm. to escape from it is intrinsically wrong. Am I getting your argument correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's I mean, it's interesting too about, for example, Christian Christian theosis, like the notion of Christian theosis, is you know I remember when I was first interested in Orthodox theology and I had read a lot of esoteric texts from other traditions, there was something about Christian theosis which annoyed me because it was like it wasn't the real, it wasn't the full thing, it wasn't like the complete absolute ecstatic you know elimination of me. And then after that, I thought I realized well actually. No, wait a minute. I like the, I think that all things are good. And so right St. Maximus says that we participate that we become God to the extent that that's possible. That's that's just the the that's the yeah, end yeah, phrases yeah. he uses. Is what he means is in something like we become God to the extent that the world can that you continue to exist. That you continue because your being is good as is good. It has a goodness you don't want to completely snuff out the 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 particularity that god has put in the world and so and and it's when i kind of understood that that i realized that the image of theosis that christianity presents is something like the fullness of all things right so all things are mirrored are these reflections of god and that that is the fullness that is the fullness like that that is more full in a very mysterious way. I don't know how to say it metaphysically, but that is more full than just the non-dual God, right? Just the 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 the, yeah, yeah. the God that transcends all things. That okay, so there there you have it. There you have we you get way up here and it's but there's it's it's got to it's got to run it's got to run the the full stack and and the goodness here and and what and i love the let's say vindelin's generation recognized something in the christianity of even their parents and grandparents who perhaps didn't have the mystical experience that they thought that they should have in order to achieve the degree of certainty that there was something in the daily faithfulness, in the daily, um, the, the kind of Protestant renunciation. Protestant renunciation was not, I won't have a wife, I won't have a family, I won't have a job. Protestant renunciation are all the tiny little renunciations that having a family entails and having a job entails and, and, and being a parent entails. And, and, Christianity is then not seen in escape from suffering, but I remember, but in a capacity to suffer more. I remember I taught a number of years ago, I taught a class on, I realized that, you know, I had a church full of people who were my parents' age. 
and many of them were struggling with their children. Now, they weren't struggling with their children in the way that the parent of a toddler struggles or a grade schooler struggles or an adolescent or a high school or even a college student struggles. They're struggling with their adult children. And to, I remember talking to a therapist years ago, I've told the story before, that she, I remember she's saying, there's all kinds of books on parenting at all these age, but there's like nothing on being the parent of an adult. And I made the point that improving your capacity to parent an adult requires deepening your capacity for voluntary suffering. Because so often with adults, and the same with children at every age, but with adults, you're going to have to stay with your adult children in their suffering because small children, small problems, big children, big problems, adult children, adult problems. God that transcends all things, creating the world mm. in love so that it becomes an, a, a transparent uh, reflection of himself in a way that doesn't destroy any of that particular, but rather, you know, gathers it in love, in multiplicity and unity, that that's a bigger vision, actually, than being a drop that goes back to Brahma. And, and this, of course, is where the personal relationship comes in, because... It is not God who is way out there. It is the God that we see working among us and the God that we see present in all that shines. And, and sometimes the God that we have to dare to believe is present in that which does not shine, that which we def desperately wish to escape from. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not here. I'm not going to. I'm not trying to defend Vedanta. No, no, no. I don't want to <laughs> defend Vedanta. I'm just using examples yeah, yeah. To, to say why I think, you know, even my own process of kind of seeing what what was precious about about. I think this is good, by the way. I think you're making so like I, I mean it again. I think this is a. I think we're getting into the logos. I feel like these are good answers that are uh, uh, like are provoking me in a Socratic way. I feel that, and I just want to share that. That's what, it's happening for me. Okay, so I, I, uh, that's good. So now can I add, in that spirit, there's two things here. So, I mean, this, this issue has been broached in some very deep um, interpersonal, interreligious, I should say, but also interpersonal uh, dialogue, which goes on to Dialogos. Uh, there's Cobb's book, you know, uh, uh, a, dialogue, a, a Buddhist and Christian dialogue that is mutually transformative. And then even more importantly, the, the anthology around the work of Maso Abe, which Christians and um, Jews and others replied to in which he said mm -hmm. it's called emptying God mm -hmm. in which he said well what we're ultimately talking about here is kenosis right and he he basically says well doesn't kenosis ultimately require right the emptying of emptiness itself the Zen notion and he says I don't see Christianity getting uh, to that uh, in some way and a way of making this perhaps a little bit more creek concrete as Jonathan uh, and sorry as Jordan was keeps calling us back to is I get what you're saying uh, how how do you make sure this isn't um, just a crypto egoism which is I don't want to I don't want to cease to exist and that's why this is so good but think about how what it looks like in practice now now again his crypto egoism egotism that's a fair point but we should also mention that the ego also has its goodness. And so the, the wanting not to exist is in and of itself not necessarily a corruption. But if, in fact, creation is good, then the good that I am given as an image bearer of God is something that is worth actually appreciating and affirming because the existence itself is a gift from God. Just a small point that I, I wanted to make it, and Jonathan's going to jump in here. And that's why this is so good. But think about how what it looks like in practice. What it looks like in practice is I am constantly trying to cease to exist. That's in the sense that that Christian, the, the idea of kenosis and of self-emptying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. The way Keep that going. Christianity functions is like humility, self-sacrifice. You know, of, of giving yourself. Yeah, giving yourself in love and the surprise or or, or the, the surprise really that that's the actual anchor of being that, that that's the actual anchor of how you how you exist 
uh, you know, and, 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 the, and the resurrection in the end, you know, what is resurrected is all my gestures of self-sacrifice are resurrected into me. But me, in, I mean, obviously in a mysterious way, in, in a mysterious, so the, there is something, everything about Christianity is this kenosis. Without yes. understanding that, you can't understand any of it. Like, why is, why do we okay. have martyrs? Good. Why do we have all these things? Like, you know, it's like everything about it is this emptying that, that okay. brings fullness. Okay, so you're saying something really good. And I, I want to push on it because I believe you're not making a performative contradiction. A performative contradiction is when you're making a claim that undermines your ability to make the claim, right? Uh, like, uh, if, 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 if I was to say, right now I am completely unconscious. Yeah. No, no, I have to be, right? A performative. And I agree with Whitehead that performative contradictions are much more important than, right, uh, propositional yeah, probably, contradictions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so good. So. One way it sounds like you're doing is you, you sound like saying, well, I'm pursuing this because, right, I, I, I think dis dissolving or disappearing is really good. And then what I'm trying to do is I follow this is to try to dissolve and disappear. And that sounds like, well, no, like, who are you to make that, like, do you see what, what, why it's, there's a bind there, yeah. right? And, and you were pushing up against that. I want to give you space because okay. we're, we're, I, I agree with what you just said. I think we're really, uh, again, good dialogos. We're really moving into the heart of this. This really hangs on kenosis, uh, and obviously agape, uh, but right, it hangs on it in a really, really mm -hmm. crucial manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm presenting this as a bit of a paper tiger. I hope for you, it's like, oh, you're not saying that, but say why you're not saying that more. Okay. Well, so uh, Saint Paul, you know, Saint Paul has this image where he says, "It's not, it's not, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me." And yeah. you know it's a beautiful sentence because it 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 captures the the it captures the paradox, which he's not he's not actually saying I don't exist anymore. No, he's saying it it's it's Christ that lives in me, and so he's affirming himself to the extent that he is a manifestation of the of the logos, and that is what is left. Now the the the, the way to go to get there is to. You know, is to shed, right? To shed a lot of the things that I, my passion, the things that I care about. But that ultimately, once I do that, once you do that, and you, you can experience it fractally. It's not like I'm going to get to the end of it and all of a sudden I'm going to realize, oh, yeah. I've been, I've been self-sacrificing this whole time, and so now finally, I've, I, it's like you see it happening nonstop. Which is that when you, when you enter into a loving relationship with someone and you let go of your just proper desires and all the things that you want and you kind of seed way to that then you realize that it, it it brings the person you and them together and what what comes out of it is more than what was there before and so you're like oh wait a minute it's not it's not like this one thing that i'm doing like you know i'm, I'm stacking all my good work so that when i die then no, no, like, no, you no, know no. what i mean it's like no i'm i'm noticing it happen mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. every time that i that i enter into that mode of being where i'm and, and that's John's agape speech. With, with agape, you you can use the example of the child. You pour into the and you pour into and you pour into and you just keep pouring into the child. The mother, the mother just keeps sacrificing for this child, sacrificing for this child, sacrificing for this child, and and hopefully, what the mother gets out of that is a really beautifully formed child growing up into adult and and eventually gets this adult daughter that has that has received all of that agape and what receiving all of that agape has done is now given that daughter the capacity to do what the mother did for her to the next generation and so then you have the maiden mother matriarch now the matriarch looks at the mother who is her daughter doing this for the grandchild and you just see the glory going but now we have to keep the eschatological and the apocalyptic in, in sight here because we do live in the age of decay and we, we notice that there are many times in which agopic love leads to it didn't it didn't fulfill I poured myself into the field and the harvest didn't come in terms of abundance and, and so that's where that's where you begin to understand the apocalyptic and how the apocalyptic is always present even though it's off in the distance 
because it's also deeply tied to the eschatological. And, and that's where in the eschatological and the apocalyptic, all of these things are sort of magnified from where, from where we see them. And, and I loved earlier where, where Jordan Hall, you know, basically used a shorthand for Kronos time versus Charles Taylor writes about these, these other kinds of time. Time is a, is a tremendously um, strange thing for us to talk about. Where I'm, where I'm not holding on and I'm not grasping, then what happens is I see more come out of it, and I see more of of myself. Like I see more, I see more of who I truly am. Right to say. Yeah. So you're saying you're, you're this. You first of all, I hear a couple things here. There's the realization that the self is inherently dialogical, not a, a monad, I, a self-isolated thing, but it exists dialogically because that's that your argument. I think depends on that. Secondly, you're invoking reciprocal opening again, and you're saying if you put those two together, the self is dialogical and reciprocal opening, you can move from being egocentric to reality centric, but that doesn't feel like a loss, that feels like a gain. Is that okay so far? Yeah, 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 I'd say that. Like that. Okay, really good. Um, this is very good. So, is it fair to say, uh, I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be deductive, I'm trying to be dialogical, so I'm not trying to be reductive, but is this, is this, is this the grounding of your faith? Do you know what I'm trying to say? I, again, I'm not talking about propositions being derived from more deeper propositions. We've gone through this thing about how do you get the particularity of your Christian faith? Is this, in that sense, please be fair to me, is in that sense, is this the grounding of your Christian faith, the way I just described it? Now, grounding is super difficult because, of course, it's a metaphor. But I would say yes. Um, and this is going to lead into can he love? I love because he first loved me. That this is, this is super difficult because, again, when you talk about Christianity as such, who is a Christian, yada, yada, yada. We, we clearly know that there are there are exceptional Christians and less exceptional Christians. And the pastor of a church knows this deeply. But but a pastor of a church also knows that you would never just sort of put up a put up a chart in the in the church and say, these are all our great Christians and these are our lousy Christians, because the lousy Christians, both the lousy and the great Christians can surprise and disappoint. It's just always the way it is with human beings. But at the heart of Christian conversion, and this is, I think, why the next generation after Idzard's grandfather, and Idzard's generation really tried to, each generation sort of tries to correct what the previous generation does, to say, no, you know, Grandpa Vendelin, you were a stellar Christian. You might not have had that mystical experience, but the suffering that you bore and the agape that you that you leaned into gives evidence to the fact that you have received agape and now especially in my own tradition where all the tra all the traditions have sort of different ways of trying to deal with things that can't be resolved and so that balance isn't exactly the right word it's the antinomies that they just have to struggle with and all the traditions struggle with them in their own ways and and so of course in the calvinist tradition it's it's this love of God that I have received that I simp that has to flow through me to the rest of the world. And, and sort of the difference is those who have received love and have no gratitude for it. And that's why at the heart of the Heidelberg Catechism, you'll hear it in every sermon of mine, misery, deliverance, gratitude, misery, deliverance, gratitude, misery here in the age of decay, deliverance that somehow I, I see myself as receiving this agopic love from Christ to me. And then now that, because as C.S. Lewis said in that great screw tape uh, quote I used in last Sunday's sermon, just as God is full and overflowing, now as he fills me with his agopic love, I can do the same. But, that, but, but, but the, the process of, of agopic love is canonic in that it is, it is continual self-emptying and you just wonder, can I give more? Can I give more? Dare I give more? The world might, around might say, you're irresponsible to give more. But, but 
here I give more. And you see that in great Christian saints. Now let's have, um, this is some of my favorite part of the conversation. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to say it back to you with, with a yes. slightly different way, but I, I think I heard you. Um, so, so all three of us happen to be fathers. Yes. We have children. And we have the first person experience, therefore, of the kenosis that is intrinsic in parenting, all the way down mm -hmm. to the color of your, the hair in your beard. And <laughs> yeah, and the loss of your life, you lose years for every child. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And to the unique qualities of possibility of joy that are exclusively possible in this creative act. Mm -hmm. gated or mediated simultaneously by both the kenosis and the communion and the unparalleled degree of new qualities of grief that are available also in this mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. and in the recognition in yourself that both in spite of and because of the aforementioned it is incomprehensible that you could be even vaguely who you are absent that. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. Um, that's probably the closest to the grounding of my faith that I can get to. And I have a, a and you, process where I go, oh, 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 right. And, and notice how, now he said it pretty fancy, okay? But notice how it's not esoteric at all. It's very real. And, and, and by real, I mean like, all the whole stack is right there the whole stack is right there and 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 so personal relationship with christ yes because it's as jonathan said it's not me but it's christ through me if my grief at the suffering of my children is x how much greater is god's grief at the suffering of all of creation and i right. notice that there's something about the these connections where I can have a sense of real empathy down and, and suddenly have a really weird sense of empathy up. Huh. I get it. I get it now. You know, I get you, God, in, in a weird way because I kind of now I get my dad. Oh, my actual dad, which I didn't get before. When my kids do something like, oh, I get it. I get what was going on in the experience of a being who loves me from the outside, like from before I existed and understands me in a certain context. And then through that line, there's a way of having a quality of relationship with the Abba. And so that, like the rightness of that, the way that that actually develops, the way that grounds everything else. And by the way, in this note, also philosophically and metaphysically, um, yeah, I would say that's probably the ground of my faith. So I heard you saying, I want to put two grounds together if you'll uh, uh, prevent me from uh, I hope I'm not grinding things um, but um, like so there was this one which is um, the the ontonormativity the goodness of being and therefore any attempt and I'm picking up on Jonathan here any attempt to escape is ultimately misguided and then I'm, I, I'm fulfilling that commitment to ontonormativity Get entering into reciprocal opening, deep inner relationship with the goodness of being. And the best way I experience that is in the kenosis understood as agape, because of course, parental love is the metaphor, the, the, the paradigmatic example of agapic love. And Christianity um, captures that, sorry, I don't have the right verb here, but just let me use that word, captures that very well for you. Is that, is that, did I say it back to you in a way that lands? Well, the captures part is, is, is not quite right. So, yeah, it's right with that. Yeah, yeah. I don't like it, but something like that. Yeah. It's more like um, strengthens, clarifies. Yeah, okay. Affords, makes possible. And supports. So, affords is pretty and good. Support. Right? Like yeah, both, okay, affords. It both pattern matches, but more than pattern matching, provides a model. And more than modeling, provides the embodied body of the church. Right? An actual yeah. living incarnation of the thing that the model is conveying that is real in the sense that all the things that I know in my deepest wisdom are the right ways to be in relationship with other people are lived in the community of my church. Okay, so... Uh... And that last bit is so important because, again, this is why the practice of Christianity 
involves a church because not everyone has a family and involves a family but but the church is where you even have to do this for strangers and you even have to do this for local frenemies because this is this is the practice of the faith it's this it's this agape a new commandment i give you that you love one another that's the heart of it. That's the heart of the practice. And with all of the complexities of life, figuring that out. Now, there's there's a whole another really good section there when you get to the, the intimacy. And, and I don't have time to do that right now. So maybe there'll be another video. But boy, the Jordan Peterson, Brett and Heather video was wild. That video was wild. And I, I listened to just a little bit of the Daily Wire exclusive. That was wild. So anyway, um, hope this made sense. Leave a comment.